You're watching The Ready Writer, a show where I get to speak to writers of all different genres, mediums, and experiences. The Ready Writer. Are you ready? Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Ready Writer. I am your host, Casey Bell, and today's guest is Richard Haddock. You might remember Richard Haddock from our first season of Writer to Writer interviews. Let's take a listen at Richard Haddock's interview. So as um, your published author, was this something you were um, hoping to be as a child or is this something that kind of just happened to you? When I was seven, I was convinced I wanted to be an author and I got started. I was off to a great start. I had a little notepad and I'd write some crazy sci-fi or fantasy story and I'd do it almost every day. Uh, and then at about age eight, I said, you know what, I'd rather go out and play baseball. I'd rather go out biking with my buddies or whatever. So the idea disappeared, despite all the encouragement I got. 65 years later, I had an opportunity to be an author. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go for it. I've got a chance to, to live that childhood dream. Awesome. So talk about your first book. What's the title and what is the um, synopsis, the summary? The book is called Shifting Gears, 50 Baby Boomers Share Their Meaningful Journeys in Retirement. And basically it talks about this stage of life. It's interviews with retirees who are doing interesting things. Um, as I uh, retired and talked to some of my colleagues and peers, I kept hearing all these really interesting stories. And I thought these stories deserve to be told. These are, these are interesting to people, but they're also instructive to people. Um, in terms of what to do and also what not to do. Some, some people who had a hard time in their retirement as well. Were these all personal contacts or did you um, like put a, a note out there on Craigslist or something to find people or do you know these all personally? It was kind of um, all of the above. So I started out with people that I knew and who I knew had interesting stories and then every interview at the end of it. My last question, like all good networkers was, and who else should I talk to? And so I was referred to a fairly broad network of people. Um, and then I, I set up kind of an email list of all the people I'd interviewed. And every once in a while I'd say, you know, I'm looking for someone in the Pacific Northwest. Do you, do you know somebody there? Or I'm looking for someone who is working in retirement or whatever. So I, I and then this group was really responsive. They enjoyed the process and were very helpful. Um, and then near the end, I kind of said, well, there's a couple of holes in here. There's some things that I was hoping to have that I haven't gotten yet. Um, so I tried Craigslist and I'd say, hey, you want to tell your retirement story? And I thought, I don't know what I'm going to get out of that. Um, and in some of the cities that I did, I got nothing. Um, but one of the cities I wanted was Portland because I know there's neat things going on there. I actually got three responses from Portland, all of which made it into the book. Um, I got a very interesting response from Alaska. I got a really interesting guy up there. Uh, so the networking process was um, a key to this. Uh, if I had had the social media presence then that I have now, I would have just tweeted out and just said, hey, anybody want to tell a story? Um, and it would, have been, it would have been a lot more efficient than what I did. Is there any, um, out of the 50, one or two stories you, you found shocking or interesting, intriguing? They're all in there for a reason. Some are more shocking or intriguing or whatever. Um, I, there's one guy who, um, uh, actually a gay guy who uh, uh, split up with his partner of 18 years and was going through a really difficult emotional time. Um, and at about the same time, he was uh, uh, diagnosed with an increasing um, uh, vision loss. Um, and, and so now he's lost his partner and he's losing his sight. And the guy you know, went through a really rough patch, but he said in the middle of it, he discovered a spiritual response to it uh, was something called Trillium, which I'd never heard of, but it basically gave him the sense of self-worth, a sense of dignity, and the sense of, I'm going to solve these problems. 
Um, and it's really an inspiring story because he came out the other side of it. He said, this is the happiest time of my life. I've worked through two really tough problems. Um, and just one other thing on that, Casey. I, so we were having this phone interview. I'd not met the guy. And he was telling me all these stories. And then we were just about done. And he says, oh, and I forgot to mention, I was going blind at the time. <laughs> and he said, and it was really amusing because he said, that's really a big part of my life. But I, you know, I've just kind of gotten used to that. And all these other things that we talked about uh, were more top of mind for him. Have you received feedback from all of those who are in the book or some? Most of them, you know, so I sent out a complimentary book to each of the people that I interviewed, um, and most of them have come back. Um, I um, am pleasantly surprised that nobody's had second thoughts. Nobody's kind of said, geez, I wish I hadn't said that. Um, and what was really amazing to me, Casey, is how much people would open up to me um, when these were people I've known for years, that, that wasn't so surprising. But when I'd meet a complete stranger and maybe be interviewing them on the phone, um, they'd still open up and tell me things that were very much their heart and soul of their retirement, the things that were most emotionally connected to this stage of their life. Um, um, and and I, was, I was really um, glad to see people willing to tell their stories. Um, and like the guy I just talked about, you know, that was a tough story for him to tell. Um, but he felt there was a lesson there and he was glad to have it in the book. So for those who have purchased the book and read it, have you received any emails like, um, can you, can you um, do a second book and add me in it? Have you received anyone asking to be a part of your the a series or the next book? Yes, yes, uh, both. And actually, some of that was pre-publication. I had some people, as I developed my social media network, saying, can I get in your current book? Um, and as I, as I said to them, I, I said, I've got 800 pages of material to get to a 250-page book. I, I can't take on anymore. Um, there are an almost endless number of these stories. Um, you know, there's 49 million Americans who are of retirement age and a whole bunch of them have things to tell about. Um, and, and they're un unique from each other. Um, I found in the book, I was able to have 50 different stories that had very minimal overlap between them. Um, 50 different things that people are doing. Um, some inspiring, some challenging, some difficult, some uh, some more casual, but still important to the person. One of the, one of the guys um, that I interviewed said, you know, now that I'm not working, I, I need to make sure I stay mentally alert. And he said, I'm going to go back and take a course in poetry. Uh, so he went back to a community college. You know, this guy's in his 60s and everybody else in the class was 18 years old. Um, and he said that the dialogue that happened in that class and the mental stimulation and the rejuvenation of his interest in poetry, and he's now producing poetry. And, and in fact, I posted one of his poems on my, on my blog, um, and it's really good. Um, so is there anything you learned? Um, well, after you um, became into your retirement age, was there anything you learned that you wish you would have known that you can share with those who are not at that age yet? It's way more fun than I imagined. <laughs> um, the freedom that you get, um, well, let me talk on the negative side first. A, a good retirement has two things that might make it not so great and simply stated it's health and wealth. If, if you're sick or you're broke, it's, it's tougher. You, there's still some people doing some great things, but it's tougher if you've got a debilitating illness or if you're really out of money, it's hard to recover. You don't have control of recovering from both. Um, but I think on the positive side, uh, if you've got enough money to get by and you're healthy enough to be active, um, there's just a whole wealth of things that you can do. Um, one of the ladies uh, climbed Kilimanjaro after having four leg surgeries, and she did this in her 70s. Yeah. 
and, and her friends said, you're crazy. You can't do that. You couldn't have done that in your 20s. It's a six-day climb. It's 19,000 feet. What are you doing that in your, in your 70s after four leg surgeries? And she said, you don't understand. I'm going to do this. Um, and she did all this conditioning and fitness to get herself ready. And, and um, that was a big deal. And, you know, for other retirees, they say, you know, they'll read that story and they'll say, you know, maybe I ought to take the dog for a walk. Uh, maybe, maybe I should uh, go take a, a, you know, a five mile bike ride or something like that. If she can climb Kilimanjaro, I can do a five mile bike ride. Um, so the lessons aren't that I think everybody who buys my book is going to climb Kilimanjaro. But I think there are still lessons um, of things that people have done that you say that causes me to rethink my retirement. Tell us about your publishing process and what were some of the things you learned about publishing a book? Um, it's a long and winding road. Um, I found it to be, you know, I've worked in other industries prior to this. This is my first time in the, in the book industry. Um, it doesn't work, in many ways, it doesn't work in the same way that a usual business does. Um, I would say on the one hand, there's a camaraderie and a helpfulness that is incredible. People go way out of their way to help you succeed and to learn from their mistakes. I had six separate authors who kind of took me under their wing and they said, here's what I did. Here's, here's, here's what I did right. Here's what I did wrong. And here's what I still don't understand. <laughs> um, so that was, that was very helpful. I think on... On the other hand, it's an industry that is filled with content. Um, there's a bunch of people writing books and even more of them now with COVID. And it's an overwhelming flood of stuff that the industry hasn't really been able to absorb in a constructive and business-like way. How do you spot a good book? Um, and if you're an agent or a publisher, and you've got you know, hundreds of things coming in every day, how do you sift through that? Um, and so I would say that sifting through it process by both agents and publishers, um, it's just an impossible challenge. And I don't think they do it very well. I think they, they tend to take fairly superficial reactions to it um, and say, if it's Michelle Obama, I think I'll publish this book. Um, if it's Richard Haydock, uh, now who is this guy again? Um, I found it daunting and unproductive. Um, I, I took a run at, at trying to get an agent and one of the big publishers, and I just failed miserably. It just, it, it was uh, too much of a, too much. I, I didn't stand out sufficiently in that crowd. Um, and I talked to other authors who had similar experiences, some of whom went on to publish some great books. But what's the safety net under all this is self-publishing. And there are organizations that help you to self-publish, teach you some of the tricks that you need to know. Um, and so it allows you to do it your way. Um, one of the things I really love about the path that I took was um, freedom to operate, freedom to do it the way I wanted to do it and hear advice from people. I had a terrific editor who would advise me um, but that's what it was. It was advice. And sometimes I, most of the time I accepted it because she was very wise and helpful. Every once in a while, I'd say, no, I'm going to do that one my way. Um, and you don't get to do that when you're working with a random house or Simon & Schuster. When you're self-publishing, you get to. My last question for you. So now with the knowledge you do have, can you share any knowledge with um, upcoming authors who are in the process of publishing a book? two-step part of this, you know, we all think of writing a book as the big part. And I would say that once you've written the book, you're halfway done. Um, the rest of this process is getting someone to publish the book, getting someone to distribute the book, all that kind of stuff is not easy. And it's not, often it's not logical. Um, uh, I think the other part of it is the marketing and promotion of a book is a big activity. And I'm spending a ton of time 
uh, doing things like this podcast, doing things like interviews with different organizations, um, doing different events and so forth. Um, and um, it turns out that that's really fun and I'm enjoying it. I'm glad it's fun. I if it weren't fun, you know, maybe I'd just say, I guess I'm not going to sell any books because um, this is um, this is part hobby for me. This is part, you know, something something that I'm enjoying doing. Shifting Gears is based on interviews with retirees telling how they are shifting gears in their retirement. Sometimes they shift smoothly, sometimes they grind the gears, and often they take some time to find their groove. The stories reveal the rich abundance of retirement ventures from the exotic to the mundane. Discover their joys, challenges, and inspirations that were part of their journey in the next stage of life. Shifting gears will whet your appetite with first-hand tales of retirement so varied your head will spin. Sarah Zeff Geber, PhD author of Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers. The wisdom in these pages helped me realize this about our golden years. They could be our best chance to understand ourselves, live exactly how we want, and maybe even do something amazing. Matt Fuchs, journalist covering healthcare and aging news, Washington Post contributor. For more information and more reviews of this book, go to richardhaddock.com. That's all the time we have for you today here at The Ready Writer. I'm your host, Casey Bell, and I want to thank you all for joining me once again for another episode. I want to thank my guest, Richard Haddock, and again, as always, the audience, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and to share. Thank you if you have. Have a great day.